Once upon a time, the very privileged lived the way we still do, in quiet luxury, elegance, grace. It's an almost vanished way of life. Not easy to hold on to, and uh, terribly expensive to maintain. Good morning, Mr. Fitzwilliam. It's a lovely day. Thank you, Oliver. I do my best. Miss Woodworth, wherever she is. day off. Did you enjoy your luncheon at Mrs. Mudge? No. Fool woman's on a diet. Gave me one egg and a lettuce leaf. Oh. Well, let's repay evil with good. We'll <laughs> give her chocolate souffle tonight. <laughs> Bless you. She gained a ton. Where are you off to, Fitzwillie? Shopping? Mm -hmm. Do you want anything, Miss Vicky? Well, you might pick up one or two African safari tents when you can. African safari tents, yes, ma'am. Yes, so the boys can camp out. It'll toughen them up for the dangers that lie ahead. College, marriage, Wall Street. Or Altman's during the holiday season. 
right down this aisle. Oh, thank you very much. Come on. Silverware, please. A fourth floor, sir. If you mean Sterling. One oddly recognizes anything else. Twelve demitasse. Twelve soup. Twelve butter knives. Six sugar tongs. You got that? Good girl. Charge that to Mrs. G. Duncan Abercrombie. 62 Sutton Place South. And send it today. Today? Mm-hmm. For a cookout tomorrow. It's an emergency. Well, you strike me as a type who can handle emergencies. Don't you worry. It'll go out. You just sign this. Alistair Hathaway for Mrs. G. D. Abercrombie. Oddman's shipping. Fred Myers? Yeah, just a minute. Gosh, I hope Mother hasn't taken a turn for the worse. Uh, Fred Myers speaking. Oh, yes, Doctor. Are you at the flat with Mother? No, dear boy, I am with the phone at Altman's for a chest of silver addressed to a Mrs. Abercrombie. It has. Straight to you? I take it as a sign, Garland, and send it to St. Dismas. Oh, of course, Doctor. Uh, and thank you very much. Shipping, Red Myers speaking. Oh, yes, Doctor. How's Mom? Certainly. I'll pick up the medicine as soon as I can. Jensen shipping room. Red Myers here. Oh yes, Doctor. How did you find poor Mama? Good hunting, sir. Fair bag, I'd say. Silver, antique mirrors, a color television set. And now the gourmet, I think, for some goodies. And besides the Chablis, I want four cases of champagne. Tadanger Blanc de Blanc, 1961. Deliver our chill is exactly three thirty this afternoon. The reception is at six. It'll be there. Now that's charge and deliver to Mr. Paul Deckendorfer, 349 West 79th Street. Deckendorfer? Right. We'll give you a hand.
have trouble with the Deckendorfer butler? No, he was too busy counting what Albert lost to him at gin. Oh, very good. Pierre, uh, let's have a case of that champagne inside. It's a good idea, monsieur. I think St. Dismas would want to share it with us. Wait, don't close the shop. Twenty ten dollar jars on one sale slip. How's that, Mr. Fitzwilliam? Well, I'll check the record, but I think that's a new high. Dolly? Good afternoon, Mr. Fitzwilliam. The silver came and went. Oh, and very nice it was, too. <laughs> Thank you, Garland. All right, Albert, off to Philadelphia. My regards to Uncle Buckmaster, of course. And uh, don't forget to reimburse yourself for the gin rummy game. I'd rather take the loss, sir, as a punishment for gambling. <laughs> <laughs> well, children, a toast to our good neighbor, Mr. Deckendorfer, from whom this evening's blessing is flowing. <laughs> I will now uh, report on the state of our union. St. Dismas Thrift Shop in Philadelphia took in uh, $5,100, while our home organization, Serenity Through the Word, reaped over $900, making a total of a neat, tax-free Six thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, I'm sorry, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, but most of that is gone. Uh, plus a bit more. Oh, An no. old check of Miss Woodworth just came through. Ten thousand to the Tenzing Mountaineer School in Nepal. That's near Tibet. Oh. Mm. She was uh, reading the Conquest of Everest a few months ago. Bless her heart. Well, we must remember that if Miss Vicky sails out her front door as though she owned the world, it's because she thinks she still does. Uh -huh. Still, Mr. Fitzwilliam, it would be a comfort if we could build up our reserve to cover things like this. We can, Simmons. We have an opportunity to make a rather large sum of money immediately. It's outside the door right now, in the pocket of a young interior decorator named, uh, for reasons known only to his mother, Byron Casey. Oh, isn't that Pat Casey's boy who used to be second footman at old Mrs. Niebuhr houses in uh, Philadelphia? Where my uncle Buckmaster has been the butler for, lo, these 40 years. What's the deal, sir? Byron has been given $150,000 to refurnish the Horace Appleton house in West Palm Beach. Ooh. His problem is that he would like to keep as much of the cash as possible. <laughs> a problem uh, sharpened by the fact that he already spent a good deal of it on, well, on personal matters. Oh. <laughs> now, Byron is eager to turn over the furnishing of the house to us, along with $75,000. Now, it means some weeks of work for all of us, but whatever we don't spend, of the 75 is ours. Oh, oh, that's that's yeah. that's we don't great. need to spend any of it. We can keep the whole 75. Uh, uh, Mr. Fitzwilliam, let's do it. <laughs> yes. uh, in that case, let's hear from the man with a problem. Oh, right. Right. Byron Casey. Uh, will you do it, Mr. Fitzwilliam? Will you take this and save me? Uh, for the sake of your father, Byron, and uh, all Lang Syne. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Hello, Garland. You remember me? Oh, yes, indeed. And you can do it. Have everything down in Florida by January 3rd, when the Appletons get back from Europe. Do you doubt it, Byron? Not if you say so, Mr. Fitzwilliam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Byron. I know you have a plane to catch, so if you'll just give us a list of uh, the furnishings you'll need, exactly. We'll... Oh, carry on, Byron. Just Mrs. Mudge for dinner. I mean, hi. Good evening. I didn't mean to sound so startled. It's just that I've never seen a butler in full rig before. Are there many of you left? We're uh, getting scarce, like so many things, such as good manners. Oh, was I rude? I'm sorry. May I help you, miss? Um, well, you could start by letting me in. My name is Juliet Noel. I have an appointment with Miss Woodworth. Uh, by arrangement with whom, in reference to what? By arrangement with her, in reference to secretarial work. I'm afraid I don't understand. Did Miss uh, Woodworth get in touch with you? I'm afraid I don't think that's any of your business. <laughs> but just to keep the peace, she stopped by the personnel department of Columbia University yesterday and asked them to send someone, so here I am. Oh, yes. Uh, come in, sit down, won't you, while I explain. Explain what? 
afraid I owe you an apology, Miss... No. No. I was supposed to have called you hours ago, but... Well, it uh, slipped my mind. You see, Miss Woodworth is very old and rather eccentric. So I'm sure you can understand that while she felt urgently in need of secretarial help yesterday, today she does not. Funny. When I talked to her at four today, she still felt urgently in need. It's seven o'clock. More than enough time for an eccentric old lady to change her mind, don't you think? Fitzwillie, is that the girl from Columbia? Yes, it is. Well, come on up. You're late. Miss Vicky doesn't like to be kept waiting. Out of some horror movie, that man. I hope you don't talk to yourself, miss. She does and I do, and we both hate it. Well, my name is Juliet Noel. My father's an assistant professor of medieval English at Columbia University, where I'm doing graduate work in American history. I have a BA from Smith. I'm a good typist, a um, fair stenographer. And I'd like a part-time job because I want to buy a car and go for rides in the country. A good statement. Most people tell too much or too little. All right. How do you spell geriatrics? Uh, J-E-R-R-Y. A T R I X? Wrong. Well, there's always the dictionary. There are 19 ways to spell it, 18 of them wrong. How would you find it if you couldn't spell it? I guess I'd use a synonym. There is no synonym for geriatrics. Of course, you could guess and look it up, or guess again. Or I could just stop wasting your time. If you wanted a gifted speller, you don't want me. Uh, you sit down. I'm a gifted speller. I was just demonstrating the importance of my work, which is writing a dictionary for people who can't spell. I call it Enquire Within. I list all the ways that a word should not be spelled and then tell you how it should be. When it's published, children and illiterates like you will rise as one and bless me. But that's a fabulous idea. You like it? Good. Then if Fitzwillie passes on you, you can start tomorrow. Fitzwillie, the butler? The butler has to pass on me? Well, what's the matter? Are you a snob? Fitzwillie passes on everything here. Hires, fires, manages my money, balances my checkbook. The man's an absolute marvel. He's the 13th Fitzwilliam in a row to be a butler. Now, what do you think of that? I think it shows a lack of progress. Come in. You rang, Miss Vicky? Will you talk over the secretarial job with Miss Noel and uh, see what can be arranged? Well, uh, certainly, but... But you'd like a word with her first. Of course, I'll wait downstairs. I enjoyed meeting you so much, Miss Woodworth. See you tomorrow. You must have forgotten. I've already hired you a secretary. She's due next week. Do you mean Jane Fairchild, the Vanderbilt butler's niece? She's got pink eyelids, like a bunny. Anyway, we could use some fresh ideas around here. And Miss Knoll struck you as teeming with great thoughts? She didn't like you either, Fitzwilly. It'll make things interesting. Well, I certainly don't want to force anyone on you, Miss Vicky. I just... Wish I hadn't given the Fairchild girl my word. Oh, dear. Did you? Your word? I can tell by the Cheshire Cat smile that I haven't got the job. But don't start telling me a lot of buttery, butlery lies, because there's something I'd like to tell you. Whatever you're up to with that wonderful old lady, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You start tomorrow, 10 a.m., four hours a day, $100 a week. Because no matter what I am up to with that wonderful old lady, excuse me, Fitzwillie. I'm dying of hunger. I am faint. Good evening, Mrs. Mudge. The canopies are ready. Charles, would you take Miss Mudge up? And tell Grimsby I'd like to see her in my office.
because I also find her wonderful and can deny her nothing. Even a secretary who obviously will be idiotic, interfering, and ill kempt ill kempt As you say. We'll expect you at 10. Good night, Miss Noel. Old Stanley Thayer, true love Woodworth, must have left her $10 million, or even $20 million. Just hotting it up, Professor. Thank you, Maggie. I've been waiting 10 minutes for that molten lava to cool. I don't want to hurt her feelings. She loves me. Oh, Father, you always think waitresses love you, and they always do. Seriously, should I take that job? Dictionary sounds like fun. Miss Woodworth sounds a little loony, but a lamb. All that bothers me is why they're paying you twice the going rate. <laughs> well, it doesn't bother me. If Miss Woodworth is all that rich, why should I care? No, Julia, the rich don't get rich or stay rich by overpaying, over-tipping, or remembering the Dolman's birthday. Anyway, I thought she left arrangements to the sinister butler. Hey, that's right. And he hates me. Now, why would he overpay me? It's dangerous having that girl in the house, Claude. Why did you hire her? Especially after Miss Vicky gave in. Because she was so sure I wouldn't. I don't know why I hired her. All I know is it's idiotic, and now I have to unhire her. I have to wait a few days, though. And that's unfortunate. We have a new project. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. It's Willie. When old Mr. Woodworth died, and there wasn't a penny, and you started all this, it was Miss Vicky, and I understood. But it's different now. You're robbing Altman's and Jensen's and Lord knows who else because you enjoy it. It's just that I'm so good at it. Oh. Ah. Same dismiss, thrift shop. Oh, good evening, Miss Willie. I'm helping Albert to unload. Eh? Eh? Yes, I think I can oblige you. I'm sure of the typewriter, and I'm pretty sure of the rest of the stuff. Who's it for? The Fairchild girl? The one with the pink eyelids? Eh? <laughs> I left you. Uh, Albert, finished? Enjoy me in a bottle of Chablis. You know my sentiments, Mr. Buckmaster. I'll be starting back now. Oh, no, no. You, you've got to wait a few minutes. Fitzwilly wants you to take back a few things. A, a typewriter, a Xerox machine, and some other things for the, for the new secretary. Oh, yes, the Fairchild girl. The one with the pink eyelids. He hired someone else from outside. But don't worry, Albert. He knows what he's doing. Look around you. <laughs> the mind responsible for all this doesn't make mistakes, huh? Only God doesn't make mistakes, Mr. Buckmaster. Our Gimbal's label. Gimbal's Gimbal's label. Beautiful, Simmons. Just beautiful. Now, we'll need some for Jensen's and uh, Lord and & Taylor's, along with ID cards for three shipping clerks. We should be able to find everything on Byron's list at one of those three stores, except possibly the grand piano. We're going ahead with the Casey job in spite of the new secretary? Certainly. Simmons, did uh, Saul Hurok answer our letter congratulating him on the new season? Yes, I processed it at once. Good, I feel rather musical today. Despite the new secretary, about whom you all seem to be so nervous. It's just that we've never had anyone in the house who wasn't one of us. There's a lot around here a person could get suspicious of. And she was suspicious to begin with. And that's just why we're going to let her stay for at least a week. Mr. Hurok's letter. I've erased everything but the signature. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you, Simmons. Now, we are all going to be so kind and so friendly that when she does leave, it'll be with love and with promises to write. What's going to make her leave? I shall simply suggest to Miss Vicky and to Mrs. Mudge that the other's looking a bit liverish and suggest that maybe a holiday away together might be just what the doctor ordered. When Miss Vicky goes, so does the secretarial job. I told you Mr. Fitzwilliam would have something worked out. She can do a lot of prowling in a week. 
There are 12 of us, Charles, and only one of her. Now, it shouldn't be too difficult to see that she doesn't get lonesome. Starting now. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Miss Vicky's looking forward to your first session. I'll show you up. Oh, that's all right. You're probably busy and I My know... pleasure, Miss Noel. This is Albert, my first footman. Albert, this is Miss Juliet Knoll, the new secretary. Hi. Been to a costume ball? Uh, Albert's a retired minister. One might say his habit's an old habit. Albert, would you send the office equipment up, please? Do you always answer for the staff? Well, most domestics are quite shy with people above stairs, so most butlers get used to speaking for them. And I am a butler, not Jack the Ripper. Why so sunny, friend? When did peace break out? It was never a war. It's just that I had someone else in mind for the job, that's all. This is your office, the green room. Hope you like roses and daisies. You must be a born loser. You do it awfully well. I'm a born realist. If Miss Vicky wants you, then I want you. Miss Noel's here, Miss Vicky. Hooray! Psychiatrist. That's one of those silly words like pseudo and psittacosis. It starts with the silent P, idiotic. Why not Piscinery or Piscience? Or for Singapore. Exactly. <laughs> ah. A psychiatrist is a doctor to whom you tell things that you wouldn't tell your own mother. And if you did, she would have the common decency not to believe you. Have you ever been to one? No. Have you? Yes. Her father went with me and made me leave after ten minutes. She said it was confusing me. Was it? No. He wanted the rest of the hour for himself and a recurring dream he was having about a tribe of Indians on the Amazon boiling him alive and eating him. Or well, talking about boiling alive, how do you feel like lobster for lunch? Happy. So do I. It's your fits, Willie. Do you like him any better today? You will. You have a lot in common. Your scholarly types, both of you. Both of us? I should say so. Fitzwilly graduated summa cum laude from Williams. Well, then there's no excuse for his being a butler. Does he need one? Well, when there are so many wonderful things to do today, like joining the Peace Corps. Now, why would an intelligent man want to stay in a job that offers no risks, no challenges, no excitement? Miss Woodworth's residence, Fitzwilliam speaking. Hello, Byron. Are you safely back home? Yes, Mr. Fitzwilliam, back in the Florida sunshine. Look, Mr. Fitzwilliam, they're taking the old furniture out of the Appleton house now. You are sure you'll be able to make it, aren't you, by January 3rd? <sighs> uh, no. No, I'm not nervous about it, Mr. Fitzwilliam. I'm just, uh, high strung. Relax, Byron, and use plenty of suntan oil. Charles, is your cousin Thomas still footman at the Millers, and are they still in Bermuda, and is Mrs. Miller still chairman of the Symphony Association? Yes, yes, and, uh, yes. Good. Then call... Yes, Miss Vicky. Lobster, certainly, I'll tell Pierre. And there's something else, Fitzwilly. No, Miss Vicky, I never thought of joining the Peace Corps. Now, how would Cousin Thomas feel if you called up and offered to take over for him for the afternoon? Suspicious. There must be some way to get you into the Miller house and him out. Suppose I offer to work for Thomas today if he'll work for me next week. The next week, I'll say you won't allow the swap. He'll think he skunked me out of a day and be happy as a lark. 
Oh, sorry. Oh. Oliver, I need a Rolls Royce this afternoon. Not ours and not hot. The Deckendorfer chauffeur will land us theirs. We must send a Christmas card to the Deckendorfers this year. Frank, can you rent us a rather large truck and, and within the hour? We don't have to rent it, sir. <laughs> Hello, sir. Uh, Dunn speaking. Uh, I'm here with a Mr. Alistair Charles, who has a letter from Saul Hurok. Gentlemen, uh, this will introduce Mr. Alistair Charles, the manager of Signorina Domatella Frascati. In my opinion, the most brilliant woman pianist since Myra Hess. She is staying with the Reinhold Millers, preparing for her American debut. What is needed is a pianoforte worthy of this great young Italian artiste. Signed, Saul Hurok. Well, of course it is. Because it isn't the first time I've had correspondence with him, that's why. I, I beg your pardon. Yes, at once. Uh, my dear fellow, I'm not causing you problems, am I? I shouldn't have lost my temper. But damn it, at my age, it's galling to be treated like a teenager. Do you know what that old poop asked me? If I'm sure it's Mr. Hurok's signature. How old is the old poop? Eighty-three. But he has perfect pitch. And I am low man on the totem pole. I'm embarrassed, Mr. Charles, but I'll have to check with Mrs. Miller and Mr. Hurok. Uh, why not? The Miller's number, my memory. I have it right here. Uh, plaza 799970. Right. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, is this the Miller's residence? Uh, well, this is Morton Dunn at Steinway and Sons. Uh, may I speak with Mrs. Miller? I am sorry, Mr. Dunn, but Madame is out with our house guest, Signorina Frascati. Uh, may I ask who's speaking, please? This is Thomas, the footman. Oh, yes, sir. Madame told me you'd be sending over a piano. Uh, thank you, Thomas. That's all I need to know. Everything in order, Mr. Charles. Now, Mr. Hero. Oh, Mr. Dunn. I just realized you won't be able to check with Mr. Hirok. He left for Moscow a week ago. Oh, dear. Oh, that means you won't be able to oblige us uh, because of that old poop. Mr. Charles, I have Saul's letter, verification for Mrs. Miller, and my own judgment of character. Your little artiste has her piano. Mr. Dunn, you're not little man on my totem pole. <laughs> uh, I'll give you the piano all our top concert pianists asked for. Hey, it's in the storeroom. Oh. This one will be all right. But that's a brand new one. It's much too stiff for a young lady. Oh, well, this uh, young lady weighs 180, has a touch like a truck driver, and would slaughter me if I took her piano that had been used by anyone. <sighs> Mr. Dunn, you, you're too good-hearted. You're letting me take too much of your time. Now, why don't I just go over to the Baldwin Company? Oh, no, no, no. No, if the girl is uh, uh, what Saul says, she must have a Steinway. This Steinway. It'll be at the Miller's by 4 o'clock tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry. Tomorrow's too late. The girl wants to work today. Mr. Charles, that's impossible. For us, for, for Baldwin, for, for any piano company in New York. At this time of the day, the trucks are all gone. Oh, I brought my own. Obviously, Byron has his piano. That he has, Charles. Get the truck off right away. Uncle has a van waiting. Mr. Vince William, quick. It's the secretary. I don't know how long Kitty can keep her mind off it. Of what? The Xerox. She wants them to come and get it. But if they do, they'll ask where we got it. Some say that astrology is just a superstition. Oh, but I say, why would newspapers run horoscope columns if... Oh, Mr. Fitzwilliam, I was just having a nice chat with Miss Noel. <laughs> Kitty's one of our more gifted chatterers. Well, it's nice how friendly everyone is. They've been popping in and out all day. But I really would like to call the Xerox company before I go. We don't need that, and it's very expensive, so I think I'll send it back. I'm afraid you can't do that. Why not? It hasn't been used. 
Oh, look, if you got a rake off when you bought it, why don't you just say so? <laughs> That's standard butler practice, isn't it? At least in English novels it is. And you haven't noticed that uh, novels are filed under fiction? I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to insult you. Oh, what's marvelous? What can be done without trying? But uh, you still haven't said why we can't return the Xerox. Because it's a gift from a friend. Victoria Woodworth doesn't return gifts from friends for cash, strange as that may seem to you. I've been put in my place. Well, that was my very bad-tempered intention. I apologize. Incidentally, if you'd like to check this with Miss Vicky... Oh, it'll check. You have all the answers, Mr. Fitzwilliam. It's my job, Miss Noel. I'll get your coat. Well, we got through the P's and well into the Q's. It <laughs> gave us both a real sense of accomplishment. Um, what did you do all day? I started by making a tour of the house, for dust, you know. Then I supervised the polishing of the silver. After that, I had a rather harsh talk with the market about some very inferior apples. And now I've shown you to the door. You must be exhausted. No, no, I'll be fine. I'm planning a nice little nap before dinner. William, the letter of condolence group is waiting for you. But they didn't take Dolly at Gimble, sir. Someone else will have to apply. Byron Casey is calling Mr. Fitzwilliam from Florida. It just doesn't make sense. A Williams man asking no more of life than a chance to worry about rotten apples. Maybe he's got a hobby that fulfills him, like stamp collecting. Mm, he gives away Bibles. Gives away what? Bibles. Miss Vicky told me. He picks out names from the obituary columns and he sends Bibles to the relatives. Writes a letter of comfort to go with each one. I guess you could call that a hobby. Dearly beloved, unbidden, unwanted, death has entered your door and left it ajar. Uh, no hyphen in a jar. We enter with a gift of love, comfort, and with words to turn the evening of death into the glow of morning. Oh, that's lovely. Words from this, uh, what denomination is it, Albert? Episcopalian, sir. Words from this King James version of the Bible bound in genuine leatheroid, stamped on the cover as it is on your heart, the name of your loved one. If this gift, so freely given, eases your pain, pray for us. Yours for a bright tomorrow, C.R. Fitzwilliam, Prez, Serenity Through the Word. These, uh, today's answers? Uh, just the ones with the enclosure, sir. Mm. Now, that's what I call a proper thank you note. Oh, Miss Vicky, can't we start sending some of this around to publishers just to get a reaction? We'll see what Fitzwilly thinks. After all, it was his idea. The dictionary was his idea, too? Yes. He thought I needed a new interest in life after father died, because hating father had been my chief interest up to then, and I was lost without it. Anyway, Fitzwilly kept nagging me about everything, from ant collecting to... Zen, Buddhism, till he hit on the dictionary. And that got me interested in all sorts of things, such as living to be a hundred. No wonder you're so fond of him. I'm not fond of Fitzwilly. I love him. So will you, when you get to know him better. No reason why she should leave well enough alone. Grimsby, you're getting very cranky. I know. I've noticed. But all the same, Mr. Nielsen from the Old Sailor's Home will be here in a minute. You'd better come and powder your nose. Oh, in that case, I'm going to type up my notes and mail your letters and check with Fitzwilly about the publishers. Right. Come in. Oh, heads up, feet down. May I present the platypi? Jock Stewart the fifth, Carlton Taylor the fourth, Sandy Whitehead the third, Tucky Morgan the fifth, Woody Van Alston the fourth, and Bobby Merrick. What, no number? Old family, new first name. 
Platypie, may I present Miss Juliet Noel, Miss Vicky's new secretary. Hi. Uh, Platypie, hmm? As in many platypuses? We are the platypus troop, a manly and virtuous group. Opposed to almost every sin, we hate reefers, girls, and gin. That's from our troop song. Fritz really wrote the words. <clears throat> Boys, I'm sure it's time for your cooking lesson. Oui, exactement. Mm, Mademoiselle Juliette, vous êtes bien chic aujourd'hui. Ah, merci, cher maître. Mes enfants, venez. Venez en avant, oh, nous allons faire les biftecs bon. papillotés aux truffes. Mm, que vous êtes jolie. Ah, uh, hamburgers with truffles for Cub Scouts? Oh, yes. Miss Vicky won't approve the official Cub Scout rules. You like the one about helping old ladies across the street? She says that's the height of impertinence. So these are Sub Scouts, much more top drawer. They should be with me as their den mother. That's an honor I forced Miss Vicky to share as a way to get her outdoors. Oh, um, she wanted me to ask what you think of my sending part of the dictionary around to publishers now to see what the chances are. Uh, would you like a Sub Scout type drink? No, thank you. There are no chances. I took it around to almost every publisher in town some time back. They all turned it down. Said literate people can spell. People who can't spell don't buy dictionaries. Oh, I wish you'd found that out before you let her do all that work for nothing. Oh, it wasn't for nothing. It was to keep her alive. Besides, there was no time for inquiries. Do butlers always feel so responsible for their employers? Oh, I wasn't the Woodworth butler then. My father was. When I was six, my mother died. Miss Vicky took me over, fed me, bathed me, did homework with me, made herself responsible for me. So now I'm responsible for her. Aside from which, I love the old girl. <laughs> You're a remarkable man, Mr. Fitzwilliam. Now that I'm ready to take you off my list of villains, I don't know quite where to put you. Well, you have to start a new list. Butlers I have known. Hello, Father. Listen, Cotty is still editor of University Press, isn't he? Julia, you'll have to wait a minute. I'm working. You might have asked how my cold is. Quink? You must be kidding. Look it up. Quink? Learn a little something. By the way, have you been fired during the last week? No. Why, have you heard something? Juliet, I'm back. My cold's much better, dear. Thank you. Cotty still is. Hold on, I'll ask him. Would you be interested in publishing Old Lady Woodworth's Dictionary for Dopes? Who needs it? You found Quink, huh? Quink. All right, now, play. When I'm good and ready. Well, I don't mind having a look at the old girl stuff. There's nothing to lose. Juliet, Cotty's staying for dinner, so bring a couple of chapters home. Why do you have to tell the sinister butler about it? Because it'll make him happy. And there's nothing sinister about Mr. Fitzwilliam, who could give you lessons in character. Probably Scrabble, too. Albert! Albert, I want a word with you, now. And please ask the gentleman to wait, in case Miss Woodworth wants to see him again. Give me whatever you took out of his pocket. I'm going to count to three, and then I'm going to call the police. One, two. Please, miss, it's for $20,000. Um, did Miss Woodworth just give you a check for the old sailor's home? Don't tell me she wants it back. <laughs> no, but perhaps you do. I found it in the hallway. Well, that's funny. I, I could have sworn. Well. Thank you very much. Oh, Albert, you of all people. Mr. Fitzwilliam's right-hand man. How do you think he's going to feel about this? Upset, quite upset. A retired minister stealing money meant for charity? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh, I am, miss. I've been ashamed of myself for so long. Is it some sort of compulsion? Well. It all began one Sunday in my own church, 
when the collection normally under two hundred dollars was suddenly over four. I couldn't believe that I was the guilty party, so I just waited, and the next Sunday the collection was almost five. It was me, and I was improving. But with you up in the pulpit and them down in the pews, how did you do it? When I greeted them at the door and shook their hands. Did you give the money back? No, miss. I didn't want to shake anyone's faith in the ministry, so I just retired and went into domestic service. Miss Juliet, must you tell Miss Woodworth she'll be so unhappy? Well, I... I guess I could tell Mr. Fitzwilliam instead, but he'll dismiss you. It's no more than I deserve. Albert, listen. If you promise to fight the urge every time you get it, just come to me and talk it out. Then I'm not going to tell anyone. It'll just be our secret, all right? Oh, Miss Juliet. Charles, where's Mr. Fitzwilliam? At the sportsman's show. Picking up a few things. Taking him down, huh? How come before the show's over? Sold! Everyone at the store no. and all these. Some guy from uh, Saudi Arabia. Arab. Thought they had their own tents, Arabs. Well, maybe you want to change. <laughs> Grass is always greener, you know. That's the truth. How are you gonna get him out to the alley? Carry him. Store said no dollies. Didn't want to draw any attention. Sure. What do they care if you break your back? Wait a minute. I'll see what I can get. What you gonna do with these? Take them. It's neater. <laughs> $20,000, Mr. Fitzwilliam. $20,000. How could Albert let that girl see him? Well, it wasn't his fault. It's her fault. She has to go. That's all. That's for Mr. Fitzwilliam to say. Miss Woodworth's residence. Fitzwilliam speaking. Yes, operator, I will. Byron Casey from Florida. Collect. Hello, Byron. Oh, Mr. Fitzwilliam. I just had a letter from the Appletons. And they aren't coming home by boat. They're coming home by plane a week earlier to have a good, old-fashioned, sunny Florida Christmas. Uh, Byron, oh. Byron, don't cry. Oh. We'll just have everything there a week earlier, that's all. Now, the two most difficult items are all taken care of. The piano's on the way, and it's a beauty. As for the Chinese Chippendale chair, what do you think we found it? We've lost it, Mr. Fitzwilliam. The secretary saw me with it. She thought Miss Vicky would like it. Miss Vicky loved it. Oh, Mrs. Mortimer. Uh, uh, Byron? No, if you can't guess, I'm not going to tell you. Anyway, we're uh, off to a flying start, and uh, uh, there's nothing, I repeat, nothing to do worry about. So don't worry. Mr. Fitzwilliam, with, with all due respect, if a week's been cut off, I, I don't see how we can finish the job. Not with that girl here. She'll have to go. Even so, sir, do you think we can? We can, and we will, but not by wasting a whole evening. Albert, by putting a larger group to work, we could triple this week's take from Serenity. You can have everybody except Garland and Charles, and let's see, and Oliver. Thank you, sir. Well, come along. Albert, why didn't the secretary report you to Miss Vicky? She felt sorry for me, sir. Well, there are 
very nice girl. All right, gentlemen. I'm going to give you each $100, which you can easily raise to five by judicious use of the Samson and Delilah bit in the proper bars. Hotels are best. There's always a Bible somewhere around. Yes, well, I like carrying my own. You see that? Miss Julia. I just thought I'd stop down before I went. Oliver, you're in shirt sleeves. <laughs> so are you. And the sight isn't all that obscene. Well, thank you, Miss Julia. Uh, we were uh, just uh, trying on uh, costumes for a, a ball. Oh. Uh, what you were saying? What does the A and F stand for? Uh, it stands for accommodators and uh, footmen's ball. Uh, that's what A and F stands for. Accommodators and footmen. Accommodators. Well, it's uh, domestics who accommodate you when, when your owner ill or away or gone mad. You were saying? Oh, yes. Um, I took a message from Miss Vicky. It was a Miss Ziffrin from the Gotham Home for Unwed Mothers wanting an appointment. And did uh, she get one? Oh, yes. Noon tomorrow. I thought you'd like to know. Yes, yes, thank you. Well, let me show you to the door. Garland, it was very... Consider it of you to, to bring us the message. Oh, well, that's perfectly all right. Yes, well, good night. Good night. Since when do we carry merchandise through the house? Open doors without even... It's funny. Something about it, that girl bothered me. Who is it? Garland. Oh, she'll be watching Albert from now on, sir. Supposing Miss Vicky writes a check out for those unwed mothers tomorrow. By noon tomorrow, Miss Vicky will be on her way to York Harbor, and that girl will be gone. I am going to call Mrs. Mudge. Now you're talking. It's time you were. Samson and Delilah should be in every cocktail bar in this town by now. Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. But I've never done the Delilah bit before, so I was wondering if you'd run me through it once. I'll do better. I'll start you off. Yes, sir, gentlemen, what'll it be? Two scotch on the rocks, Valentine, <laughs> double. Hey, what's going on? Oh, some fella down there says it wasn't Delilah that cut off Samson's hair and the rest of them for betting that it was. They sent him upstairs to the housekeeper for a Bible to sell it once and for all. I got a five riding myself. Frank Maritan, Harrison 20. Is betting still open? Surely. This gentleman right here is holding the stakes. We're benighted fools. <laughs> I'll take another five. Bartender, where did you send to for that Bible? To the Holy Land? No, Mac, just to the eighth floor. He'll be here. There he is, Jimmy. Thanks. Oh. Samson and Delilah's at the beginning. You're crazy. That's Adam and Eve. Well, it's somewhere in the Old Testament. I have fallen among the godless. Judges 16, 19. What'd you say, Mac? Okay. And Delilah called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of Samson's head. Head. Well, I'll be so undoubtedly will we all. Altogether, we made 2,400. Oh, boy, am I bushed. Oh, it's lifting all those scotches while they sent for the Bible. The nervous tension got me, especially at the Algonquin. Oh, but I did the Algonquin. Yeah, I know. And then when I started, they called the police. <laughs> I dismissed the writing group, Mr. Fitzwilliam. We sent out over four times the usual mailing. That should bring in about $800. We're still a long way from what we lost. Well, if Miss Vicky goes off with Mrs. Mudge tomorrow and the girl leaves, we're out of trouble. Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Mrs. Mudge refuses to leave. She has a funeral and two weddings coming up, not to mention a bris and a contested divorce. Well, damn and blast Mrs. Mudge. Lord, forgive him. Uh, time for a drink, gentlemen. Don't worry, Albert. Yours is soft and low-cal. All isn't lost, children. I have an alternate plan. I'm going to ask the girl for a date. 
Well, that alone may do the trick, but if it doesn't, if she says yes, to use an expression I detest, I'm going to make a pass at her. And she'll quit at once, naturally. Why? Are you kidding? Because he's a domestic, a, a servant. That washes you out with women, Oliver. She'll quit, all right. My hat's off to you, Mr. Fitzwilliam. Well, mine isn't. Miss Juliet's a lovely girl. I don't approve of this. Well, neither do I, Oliver, but I have no choice. She is a lovely, lovely girl. Wish I could remember what disturbed me about her this afternoon. Yes, Miss Vicky? Fitzwilly, Juliet thinks that being a butler is stifling you. Well, uh, Miss Juliet is entitled to her opinion, but to me, the job has excitement. I better make that pass before I get fired and become socially acceptable. Z on a triple. 50 points. Oh. All right, all right, don't crow. Juliet, I don't know if this cockamamie thing is a dictionary, but it'd make one hell of a movie. What it is, is a running biography of our old man. He was a <laughs> genuine monster, wasn't he? And there's practically nothing about him in print. <laughs> Hello? Who? Oh, Mr. Fitzwilliam. <laughs> this is a surprise. Well, I warned you, remember? Speaking to Miss Vicky about you was just my opening gun. I remember everything you ever said to me. Juliet, and I'm thrilled that you care about what I do. Uh, um, I, um, I, I don't think you understand. Uh, <clears throat> my feelings about you aren't personal. It's, um, uh, no, I haven't had dinner yet. Listen, could you hold on for just a minute? I, uh, think the uh, coffee's burning. Just a minute. Well, you have had dinner, and, and nothing's burning. But he thinks that I'm interested in him. I, I mean, personally, don't you think I ought to straighten him out? No, 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 not now. Tomorrow on his time, not in the middle of a Scrabble game. You're right. What's the hurry, right? Right. <clears throat> uh, I'm back, Mr. Fitzwilliam. My address is, um... Oh, you do? Oh. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, I'll just meet you downstairs. In a half hour, right? Okay. Bye. No. What would you wear to dinner with a butler? My pinstriped gray, I think. Make me rainbows. Make me spring in the snow. Make me beautiful music. I just had an interesting thought. What? Well, suppose you didn't really think that I'd go out with you. Suppose you just invited me to uh, embarrass me. Oh, well, uh, why, would I, why, why would I want to embarrass you? Well, if I were embarrassed enough, maybe I'd quit my job and Miss Vicky would stop needling you. <laughs> no, that's too devious. Oh, I don't know. Anything you're devious enough to dream up, I might be devious enough to do. <laughs> but that would be the act of a complete stinker. <laughs> and if there's one thing that's been established, it's that you're one of nature's noblemen. Chez nous. Uh, may I take votre chateau, monsieur? Oh, merci bien. And où est le plume de matin? Uh, straight ahead and to the right, honey. Cupid's on the door. Uh, in the interest of better communication, perhaps we should adopt a common language. Uh, such as English, which I speak like a native. Glad to oblige a good-looking doll. Uh, come on, I'll give you the best table in the joint. The one that doesn't wobble. <laughs> Beautiful restaurant. French Ampere, the McCoy. It's perfect for us. A little uh, underpopulated for you, isn't it? Oh, a couple of dogs dropped in earlier. Not as classy as you two, though. How would you like some wine? I got a Chateau Margot I don't believe. Sold. I'll get the garçon. Only don't look at him, he gets the giggles. I'm telling you, a real dog. <sighs> you just made a conquest, which isn't too surprising. It is to me. I don't do too well with men as a rule. Well, then there's something wrong with the men you've met. Oh, I think what's wrong is with me. Shh. Don't look at it.
Uh, just a poor little for the gentleman first, son, in case there are any specks of cork. That's, that's fine. Now the uh, lady. Uh, not all the way to the class. Uh, not me. Very good, that's it. And uh, you leave the bottle. Oh, just fine. Gee, thanks, mister. Fitz Willie, you're nice. so terrible. <laughs> We're both free and over 21, aren't we? Um, I'm not your social equal. Oh, come on, don't be so silly. I don't think you should be a butler because the job isn't good enough for you, that's all. And I want to talk to you about that. Well, you can't. Why not? Because, because dinner is ready. Well, that's all right. I've already eaten, so I'll talk while you eat, all right? No. I intend to go right on being exactly what I am. And we can't even talk about it? No. Call me when you're finished fighting. I'm finished. I'm not. There you are. Look. If we can't talk about this, I, I just don't see any point in talking about anything. I mean, if that were the case, I wouldn't even want to see you again. And I certainly couldn't go on being under the same roof with you. I'd have to leave Miss Vicky. I, I can understand that. All right, so we can talk about it. No. Well, I mean... Not for the time being. I'm afraid the time being is all the time there is. Julia? I don't blame him. Well, goodbye. outrageous. Yes, I know. You won't change your mind. About quitting? Will you change yours? No, I won't change my mind. I'll call Miss Vicky in the morning and tell her. Juliet, maybe, maybe this is just a temporary goodbye. I doubt that very much. It's Willie, you may not be a stinker, but boy, it sure worked out just as if you were. Albert and Grimsby holding down the fort here. The rest of you store throughout the area, and myself combing through the St. Dismas warehouse. At least half the Byron Casey job should be completed by tomorrow. Any questions? No, not for me. All right. Good luck. Good night. And uh, my apologies to those of you who do Newark. <laughs> good night. Good night. Miss Juliet was an influence for good. She hasn't died, Albert. She just quit. Nevertheless, I don't think I can continue any longer with this organization. I shall have to think and pray. Planning a little thinking myself, right after Byron Casey. Listen, Mr. Fitzwilliam, with you in Philadelphia, no one here but Albert, thinking and praying, and Grimsby not knowing which way is up, who's going to keep Miss Vicky out of trouble? I'll take her along with me. She can have a nice visit with old Mrs. Nieberhaus. Drive faster. You never liked Julia. And I'm sure it was something you said or did that made her quit. What did you say or do? I took her to dinner. Aha! I'll stop it. Why did you ask her to dinner if you don't like her? I'm not going to discuss it, Miss Vicky. Good morning, folks. You got any idea how fast you were going? Be quiet, officer. Miss Willie, you'll discuss anything I... Now, wait just a minute, folks. I told you to be quiet, officer. And I loathe being called folks. I'm sorry, officer. Claude Fitzwilliam, how dare you apologize for me? 
If I can't ask a simple question as to why you don't like my secretary... I love your secretary, but I will not discuss it. Especially not in the crowd. Say, who do you folks think you are? What do you get off thinking you can jazz along here 90 miles an hour? Or that I got the time to stand here and listen to your kooky talk, huh? If we exceeded the speed limit, officer, you have a right to give us a ticket. You have not the right to shout at us, nor to reproach us for wasting your time. Your time is my time, and the time of all tax-paying citizens. George, you haven't stopped eating all day. Go back to Miss Woodworth's before you get fat. The man's profession is his own business. Oh, it is, is it? Yes. Okay. Let's say, just for the sake of argument, that I'm in love with him, and vice versa. Wouldn't that make it my business? Well, the theory is that if you love someone enough, nothing else matters, so there's no problem. If anything matters, then you don't love them enough, and there's still no problem. Well, if there's no problem, then how come I feel so unhappy? There must be something wrong with the theory. It doesn't seem to include you. Yes, it does. I'm going to go over to Miss Vicky's and tell Fitzwillie that if he wants to be a laundress, it's all right with me. It always helps you to talk things out with me. Have you noticed? <laughs> oh, this is marvelous. What? There are wonderful people around, Juliet. We just never meet them. Listen to this. Yesterday afternoon at the sportsman show, under the eyes of many guards, three men dismantled the Abercrombie and Fitch exhibit and walked out with it. You know why no one stopped them? Because they each wore a white coverall with A and F on the back. That's all the plot there was. Now listen to what they took. Three safari tents. Do you know how big they are? Two life-sized figures of African tribesmen, one ditto white hunter, Pots, pans, cots, a false campfire, along with a group of stuffed animals, including an African cousin of Smokey the Bear. I see. So your Xerox machine number 24289 was purchased but not received by Mrs. George Phipps, right? Pardon me? Oh, um, this is the um, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Life size. Oh, don't strain. Grimsby let me in. By which I gather she isn't really part of this uh, den of thieves. I beg your pardon. Let's not waste time, Albert. Just tell me who gets robbed and how. Miss Juliet, I, I think the world of you. But my loyalty is to Mr. Fitzwilliam. And did no one hire? Sarah Neva House cheats a backgammon. Then how did you manage to win? Well, once she started cheating, I... Juliet! Now, you two have a nice little chat while I go up and do... Uh, uh, something or other. Where's Albert? In the staff room with a bad headache, which he got from answering my questions about Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves. The others are still out thieving. Would you answer a question? Yes. No, I'm not going to the police. Well, that wasn't the question, but why not? Well, Albert swears that you haven't taken a dime from Miss Vicky. She hasn't had a dime since I started all this. What about the people I have clipped? Albert says it's mostly insurance companies who get hurt. And uh, you don't think that's stealing? Listen, you just asked the question I said you could ask. The 
question I wanted to ask was, why did you come back here today? To say you win? I don't care if you're a butler or a chiropodist. Julian? I love you. That's what I meant. <laughs> oh, boy. Look whose dull, unadventurous life I've been worrying about. Lefty Louie. You marry me anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, that's shocking. Of course, if we're going to get married, you've got to stop being a crook. I mean, I'd like to have children, three or four. So? Crooks have children. <laughs> well, I don't think that's very nice. I mean, if every time you're late for dinner, I have to say, Daddy's probably in the pokey. <laughs> It'll be too scary for them. For me, too. Would you mind terribly not being a crook? No, not really. But there are problems, like uh, Byron Casey, Miss Vicky's future. You know, when her father died, she inherited exactly $180. I haven't been able to accumulate too much since then. Oh, come on. I saw one day's take from that crazy Bible thing. And what about St. Dismas? Well, quite a few of us, you know. And, and we live quite well. Yes, I've noticed. Most of what we make, Miss Vicky manages to give away to the various charities. We try to limit her uh, generosity. Albert retrieves checks, and I always inspect the mail before it goes out. <gasps> it's Willie. You're going to hate me. That's what I noticed that disturbed me yesterday when you left. You had letters. But only one check. See, I told you you're going to hate me. No, I don't know. I don't. How? How uh, much? Sit down, Fitzwilly. Fifty thousand dollars. The Cancer Research Foundation. <laughs> Some crook you are. Plotting, working the staff to the bone, and all for charity. Well, the object wasn't to amass a fortune. It was just to support Miss Vicky in her customary style. Fitzwilly, when you found out that she was penniless, why didn't you just tell her the truth and get a job and support her? I was afraid the shock would be too much for her, and she was so frail and sickly. She's strong as an ox now. She's also very moral, unlike certain people I know. She'd want to know what she's been living on. And she'd want me to pay it all back. Well, that's out. Miss Woodworth's residence, Fitzwilliam speaking. Yes, operator, I'll accept the charges. Byron Casey's from Florida. Collect. Albert certainly covered everything, didn't he? Yes, Byron. I have a great many things to report to you. And I have just one thing to report, Mr. Fitzwilliam. The Appletons will be here tomorrow. I don't care when they're due home. They hated Venice, so that's when they'll be home. And you know what's in this house so far? Uh, there's a piano. You're right. Well, you have to admit it's a, a beautiful piano. And your silverware, glassware, and chinaware went out today. Uh, plus four TV sets. Of course, color TV. Oh. <laughs> Byron, Byron, please don't cry. Well, you know I'm not going to let you down. Just give me a minute to come up with something to tell the Appletons. Oh, no, I can't face them. Uh-uh. Not till every stick of furniture is in this house. I'll go into hiding. That's what I'll do. I'll hole up someplace till you give me the high sign. Goodbye, Mr. Fitzwilliam. I'll let you know where I am. Fitzwilliam, let him furnish the house. Just give him back his old 75000 and forget it. I would just love to. Except some mountain climbers in Tibet have 5000 of it. Some old sailors have another 20, and some doctors in cancer research have 50, so I can give him back exactly nothing. We're all going to land in jail unless I think of something fast. Too bad they don't carry big, fat lumps of money at Lord and Taylor's and Gimbel's. You could pick one up and ship it to St. Dismas. I could send what to St. Dismas? 
Bad joke. Forget it. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Hey, wait a minute. You're not going to be a crook anymore, remember? Juliet. Juliet, my love, do you think you could sit still for one last caper? No. Even one that would take care of Byron and keep Miss Vicky in style for the rest of her natural? If I promise, it'll be the last. On my honor as a sub-scout and a platypus. Okay. <laughs> okay, Lefty Louie. When's all this going to take place? On the night before Christmas, when all through New York, large lumps of money are bouncing like cork. <laughs> no, I mean, what's the plan? Who are you going to rob? Well, I can't tell you that. You'd be accessory before the fact. Party to criminal action. So I don't care. Well, I don't care if you don't care. I'm not going to tell you. No, I'm not going to marry you then. Oh, you certainly are, and you know it. OK, but I'll tell you this. I am going to find out. Oh, I don't think so. Oh, with that bunch of blabbermouths you have around here, with Albert right in the palm of my hand, I'm going to know everything you're up to long before Christmas Eve. Jingle bell, jingle all the way. Oh, I'm going to do my driving on the horse Jingle bell, jingle bell. Now, where are the scissors? Oh, I've got them over here. Oh, I've got them. Thank you. Jingle bell, jingle all the way. Oh, I'm going to do my driving on the horse today. Look, Oliver. That's great. And no one's taught. She still doesn't know a thing. Everybody's been absolutely marvelous. Well, especially Albert, who took the worst of it. It's been easy, sir. I don't want this on Miss Juliet's conscience, nor on yours, Mr. Fitzwilliam. For you to enter holy matrimony, red-handed as Why don't you just worry about your own conscience, Albert? I don't have to, Charles. I've promised myself I shall be punished for all my sins, including this. Miss Vicky has had her hot toddy, sir. Grimsby's just tucking her in. Good, then we can start. <clears throat> Miss Woodward's residence, Fitzwilliam speaking. Byron, Byron, where on earth have you been? Why didn't you call me? I found the place to hide, Mr. Fitzwilliam. I'm at the Miami Doctor's Hospital. I told him I needed a checkup and... Why should I have called you? Do you have the stuff? Christmas Eve? Tomorrow night? Oh, that's wonderful. That... What do you mean you'll wire it? How can you wire furniture? Now, don't you see that you can tell the Appletons that you have been ill, but you have their money? But I don't want $75,000. Oh. Byron, please don't cry. I want furniture. <laughs> As for what you lost before you came with us, uh, there's the uh, piano, the crystal, the china, the silverware. Now, that should take up the slack. That's right. Good thinking, Byron. Now, listen, you wait for my wire. Then you go to the Appletons, tell them the story, and I think then there will be peace on Earth all over Florida. <laughs> Byron, uh, why are you crying? Oh, well, that's, that's uh, very gratifying. Goodbye. Now he's crying because he's happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, children, shall we get started? Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen when the snow lay round about deep and... <laughs> Very funny. Would you excuse us for a moment? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Come on, Fitzwilly, I want to help. All right, then. Keep Miss Vicky busy tomorrow from 2 to 6. That's very important. Oh, big deal. She will be busy, and you know it. Father and Cotty are coming for cocktails. And Grimsby will see that they stay upstairs. But I'd feel so much better if you stay. Good night, darling. Oh, wow. Sometimes you act just like a butler. All right, children. Final review of our final project. Operation Get Out While You're Ahead. <laughs> our objective is the cash in the cashier's office on the 10th floor of Gimbel's. Tomorrow, December 24th at 5 p.m. Our method? To create a situation wherein Gimbel's will consider it more advantageous to hand the cash over to me than to keep it themselves. Now, we must expect the unexpected, so adjust to it, ad lib. 
No matter what arises, I must, and I repeat must, be in that cashier's office at precisely 5 p.m. Let's go step by step. It's 4.15 at Gimbel's. on this section has had the good sense to call the security guard. Where are the covered television sets? I don't know. Because we are on a stack of Bibles. I security, 10th floor. Let's get some of those James Bonds off their prats. What this is this, a canine country club? Oh, Ryan, Goldfarb, get out of the street floor. There's a tie-up at the doors, and that's meat and potatoes for the shoplifters. What kind of a tie-up? Oh, just a bunch of kids singing carols. And boys, uh, take it easy. Smile, speak softly, remember our image. Pritikin, there's a lot of money in the store. Well, that's the object, Odeblatt, so be happy. Keep calm. Right. 
Call Pritikin. Get help. Okay, Ryan, I'll send everybody. Have all security men report to me on the street floor, north side. Christmas. Yes, Mr. Pritikin. Pritikin, you, you can't leave me here with all this money. I'm, I'm not a well man. Well, close up the vault and stop worrying. This is a traffic jam, not a robbery. It's never a robbery uh, until they rob. <laughs> Yeah, mon vieux, is it not time? Stand by. All the detectives are on this floor. All the money is on 10th floor, and Albert is in position waiting. Finish deck the halls. Oh, can't I? Just watch me. Okay, now two at a time. Take them out easy, but take them out. Hey, Juliet, look at us. Lady, are you with these kids? Are you with this ghastly store? If so, didn't it occur to you that they could get hurt standing in these doorways? Believe me, you haven't heard the last of this. Come, Platypie. Done, you may have four. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Merry Christmas. Four fifty three. Precisely, sir. They'll be bringing them up. Hey, 
why I'm calling the police, so that you will find out. Sydney Martin of Eastern Reinsurance Company, we are very disturbed about your situation. Well, do you think I'm not? How does Eastern know about it? Who sent for you? I've been here all day. One of us always is when a heavy intake of cash is anticipated. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, no reason why you should. We're merely protecting our interest. You may have a riot brewing, Mr. Oderblatt, or a robbery. No, 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 no. When that occurred to me, I called in for instructions. Good. What, what did they tell you to do? To remove from the premises all bills over the denomination of 10. Do you mean I'm supposed to just hand money to you? I can't do that. I, I, I don't know you. I'm prepared to identify myself. And I may say, if you handed me a dollar without my identifying myself, I would have had you fired. When I sign the receipt for the cash, you will, of course, check my signature with those on the cards. Seems to be in order. You can also call my office, but in that case, the loss of time would be your responsibility and not mine. Mr. Autoblatt's telephone for you. It's Eastern Reinsurance Company. It's urgent. in dire need, sir, and it is Christmas Eve. St. Dismas. And Byron's check is on its way to Florida. <laughs> and here we all are. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, we're not. Where's Albert? Gentlemen, I've confessed my crime, and I insist on my constitutional right to be arrested. Where's the money? How did you get those Eastern Reinsurance identifications? And where's the money? The district attorney's office wants to know how many people you have worked First, Where's the money, please? It was stolen from me by one of your customers. I don't feel well. I'm not buying that. Where'd you stash the stuff? 
I've got to lie down. Re really, I, I do. Uh, Ryan, go for uh, Get Odeblatt something to lie down on. And some aspirin for me. All right, quit stalling. I'm guilty. Arrest me. Not without notifying your next of kin. I'm an orphan. You're homeless, too, I suppose. I live at 168 Riverside Drive. 168. Now, wait a minute. That's the home of Miss Victoria Woodworth. Albert, you're lying to us. Mr. Adams, I am not lying. I am Miss Woodworth's first footman. You don't say. You see? I told you I had to, to lie down. Hey. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Information, I'd like the number for Miss Victoria Woodworth, 168 Riverside no, Drive. No, you mustn't call. You mustn't. Oh, it's all right, Albert. Hey, another one down. But, Miss Vicky, what did your old man plan to do with Central America once he bought it? Turn it into a resort hotel. One country for hunting, one for golf, so on and so on. <laughs> Came pretty close, too. When we finish Chapter O, you'll see why it fizzled out. Judith, this party's going to fizzle out if your fiancé doesn't turn up soon. Oh, he's, um, out doing a little last-minute Christmas shopping. That'll be Vince Willie now. It's really, we're all waiting for you. What on earth you... What? Who? Oh. Oh, yes, that could be uh, Sophia Adams' boy. Yes, put him on. He's the son of one of my oldest friends. Elliot, how is your dear mother? Well, you know how he is. He might have passed a church it's on the funny. way home and dropped in. Gimble's just called. Darling, no one's been on that phone except the son of an old friend of Miss Vicky's, Elliot Adams. Who happens to be the assistant district attorney, calling from Gimbel's. They've got Albert. They've got Albert for what? For stealing all of the cash in Gimbel's. He went in and confessed. That's what? crazy. Why would he do that? Well, I don't know. You can ask him yourself. Miss Vicky says that you're the only one who can get him to tell what he did with the money. She wants you to go with her to Gimbel's right now. I'll be punished for my sins now, and that's what I've always wanted. I'm a happy man, sir. Can't you see that? I can't let you do it, Albert. Can't you see that? But you must. It's my wedding gift to you and Miss Juliet. Young man, haven't we met someplace? Well, no, sir, we have, but have not. Now, listen, Albert. He's not getting anywhere. Ellie, don't be such a stuffed shirt. I'm sorry, Miss Vicky, but the DA's office can't ignore a crime just because it's a first offense. It's not like uh, tennis, where the first serve doesn't count. Yes, but what about the money? Oh, lie down, Mr. Odeblast. You're not a well man. Oh. Ellie, I should hate to have to tell the DA why you were expelled from Hotchkiss. Miss Vicky. Still, that might be just a boyish prank. On the other hand, your expulsion from Harvard seems to me to show a definite lack of character. Dear Miss Vicky, even if I could be blackmailed, it wouldn't alter the situation. Gimbel's has lost $190,000. Well, they can punish my footman or get their money back, not both. What do you mean, we can get our money back? I will not be cheated of my punishment. If you do this, I'll, I'll go out and rob Cartier's. It's not so easy. I tried it. Fitzwilly, I need a blank check. Why? I beg your pardon, Miss Vicky. I meant, uh, can it uh, wait? I, I don't have any of your uh, checks with me. Counter check. A counter check. Counter counter check. Oh, don't worry about Albert. The charge will just be. What, what, what was it, Ellie? Impersonation with intent to defraud. And Ellie will tell the DA to suspend it. Miss Vicky, I can't tell the DA. I can just advise him. Ellie, I should hate your dear wife up in Coscop to know about the dancer your poor mother had to pay off. Countage. Fitzwilly, to Gimbel's for $190,000. Juliet, I give you Fitzwilly. Fitzwilly, I give you Juliet. Fitzwilly, dear, though you didn't say so, I know you were provoked with me at Gimbel's for writing that check. He hates my dipping into capital. But this wasn't capital. It was new money I earned with the dictionary. So that makes it all right. Can't you show him? $500,000.
$500,000 from Opal Pictures. And that's only for A to K. L to Z, she'll sell later for more. <laughs> if the movie about Miss Vicky's father is the sensation Opal Pictures thinks it will be, they will undoubtedly make a sequel. Anyway, Fitzwilly dear, take charge of it and use it to good advantage as you always do. Hello? Oh, Fitzwilly, it's for you. It's a Baron Casey calling from Florida. Hello, Byron. Yes, I, I did call, Byron. I just wanted to say... Merry Christmas. Make me sunset.